Hey guys, Mark here from Red Star, and welcome to the Red Star Show. Thanks so much for tuning in, whether it's either uh, YouTube or SoundCloud or however you're doing it, Facebook. Thanks, you guys. Um, I want to talk about a couple things today, a couple of uh, things that I call the three C's of dog training. Um, something I always consider whenever I'm training a dog, especially training, but actually interacting in general. So, but a couple of things I wanted to talk about first. Uh, in news, there was a Mondial Ring trial here <clears throat> last weekend that I was not able to go to, but I just wanted to say congratulations to all those spectators. Spectators, congrats, well, all the spectators too who went out to see it. Congratulations to all the competitors who went out there and did it. It's hard, hard work. Protection sports and um, very exciting sports to watch. If you guys haven't seen it, Mondial Ring. Um, uh, we're in the Twin City area here. Uh, look in your area and see if there's Mondial. Check it out. It's real fun to watch. It's it's a really exciting sport. Uh, it's very similar to French Ring, if you guys are familiar with French Ring, which I'll I'll break down mm -hmm. these. Excuse me. I'll break down these sports at some point, for for those of you guys who don't uh, aren't familiar with them. Uh, but that was really exciting. Congratulations again to all those people who went out, trained hard, and threw it all uh, threw it out all on the line threw it all out on the line uh, there is a couple dog food recalls Merrick has recalled their backcountry treats uh, that are involved with beef and also uh, Castor and Pollux has recalled a couple of treats I think they're all under the Merrick brand name or something or parent company whatever anyway uh, it's involving beef thyroid and the same thing with Dave's uh, dog food there's a food called Dave's dog food I believe uh, they're canned food with beef. Something's going on with elevated hormone levels in the beef thyroid, which, you know, is terrible for our dogs, apparently. It's, so they're recalling it, but also a bit alarming. Like, why would all the beef thyroid hormones be elevated? It's very interesting. What was something in the food, environment, conditions? Interesting. Well, scary. So those are the recalls. Um... So yeah, we're going to talk about the three C's and then we're going to talk a little bit about tug of war too. So the three C's of dog training are consistency, clarity, and compensation. Okay, these are the three things I always try to consider whenever I'm training a dog. Consistency, which is like the umbrella, right? Everything needs to be consistent. But then to break it down with clarity. And then, of course, compensation is our reward system, okay? Okay. So we all know that dogs learn, and we learn, any living being that's learning some type of a something is going to learn through consistency and repetition. This is how we're wired. If we're learning uh, to play an instrument, or we're taking a boxing class, or a dance class, or something, they're going to give us um, little patterns or passages to work out. And you work them out, and work them out, and work them out, until you don't have to, until they become muscle memory. And when they're muscle memory, we no longer have to think. We're able to just react with the right, with the appropriate response. So we're trying to do this as handlers, and we're also trying to achieve this out of our dogs. So consistency is everything, okay? If you can maintain absolute consistency in all that you do, from the moment you take your dog out to work them, to how you're rewarding them, to how you're cueing them or prompting them, or whatever it is that you're doing, signals that you're giving them, keeping those signals consistent it's going to it's going to accelerate your rate of learning okay but when you're inconsistent you do something this time and you do something this time and the next time you train you're doing something completely different you, it's going to slow your i mean you might get to where you need to get to but it's going to take a long time okay so it's not very fun to be kind of monotonous and repetitive for some people but for me I don't mind at all because it gets me to the end goal of course uh, as quickly as possible with the least amount of conflict, which is our number one all-around training goal. So remaining consistent in everything you do, it's going to accelerate that rate of learning with your dogs. Okay. Next thing we want to talk about is clarity. Clarity, again, falls within that umbrella of consistency. And clarity means communication, right? And the reality is we don't speak the same language, so our communication is totally limited from the get-go. All we have is our sounds, cues, commands, signals, whatever you want to call them, uh, that's all we have is our sounds and our cues and the dog's uh, responses to those signals. 
at the end of the day we shouldn't we should be able to achieve the behavior from just the signal without the presence of reward or threat of correction or visual cue or some type of cheerleading to help the dog out we should be able to just say boom sit spin jump whatever it is and the dog should just do it and of course we get there by systematically um, you know reducing these little th this help with these cues these these training tools that that we have along the way we need to reduce those training tools to get to the end result so but it needs to be done systematically okay so with clarity for me it's all about the information I'm giving the dog again with the consistency being complete completely consistent uh, in all of the information I'm giving and usually for most of us we're looking at sound okay sometimes there's visual things if you're getting into hand signals or you need to lure or prompt or something which of course we fade those things but we don't ever fade our, our commands cue signals whatever you want to call them so um, what I try to do is not make any sound that isn't relevant to what I'm trying to do to what I'm trying to achieve within that little training session so I don't do a lot of cheerleading I try not to um, rein even with like positive reinforcement verbally I try not to do any of that stuff if I don't have to uh, I try not to give any extra commands. I don't. I don't say anything that I don't have to say. And because of that, the less sound I make, the more relevant the sounds that I make are. And I feel like if I make too much sound, I'm throwing too much information at the dog, and the dog is then forced to sift through all this information I'm throwing at it. And I'm going to hope that at that point, the dog will grab on to that relevant sound that I'm looking for. Okay, so less is more in this case when it comes to sound. And then there's tone production, which is something I call it. I ripped off from music, which basically means the quality of your sound. I'm going to talk about this um, in, to a great degree. But for now, just trying to keep the same actual quality of sound. So sit, 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 whatever. You're almost singing your sounds to your dog. That way the dog will interpret the sound exactly the way we want it to because it's consistent. So if I say sit, 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 those are four completely different sounds, if you ask me. And I'll show a nice little demo with my puppy, when he, well, with my dog when he's a puppy, of when I trained him with a pitch pipe. <clears throat> and you'll be able to kind of see it to a pretty great degree. But uh, sound, per tone production, and the quality of our sound is ultra important. It's all we have at the end of the day. So keep these sounds clear. Don't make any sounds you don't need to make. Try not to talk to your dog, especially when you're interactively training. Um, yeah, keep those things in mind, okay? And the third one is compensation. And compensation is, is uh, you know, how we're, our reward system, how valuable is our reward system. And an easy way to kind of make an analogy would be us, humans, in the fact that we work to get paid. And when our boss or whoever gives us a raise or an unexpected bonus, that's basically that's uh, a recognition of value. They value our work, the quality of our work. So then the quality of our work from that raise or bonus becomes reinforced. So what I always say is like if your boss says, hey, will you make me a copy of this? And you make him a copy or, or whatever and you come back and, and they say, cool thanks here here's a hundred and twenty five dollar bonus the next time your boss says uh, hey you're gonna hop skip and jump all the way in there thinking maybe I'm gonna get another hundred twenty five dollar bonus for doing something very little so I try to take this approach when I'm training the dog I pay big for little things in the beginning uh, some people have referred to it as jackpotting the rewards so you say sit, the dog sits beautifully, you say okay to release the dog, and you give them nine pieces of food, or 19, or something really, really, uh, and a really good quality food too. The dog really uh, puts a lot more effort into the execution of these behaviors because of the anticipation of a valuable reward. So rewards can come in the form of uh, food, you know, or play fetch or tug of war which we're going to talk about here in a second tug of war is an extremely valuable game so if you pay big pay huge pay often for little things in the beginning and then gradually over time systematically fade your rewards as you need to i mean at that point you're probably chaining behaviors together and 
um, you know, asking for more. Uh, you systematically fade your rewards, and then you end up with a trained dog. And at the end of the day, the dog can do a whole routine. Maybe it's 45 minutes, whatever it is that you're doing. And at the end of your routine, you can give the dog a grand reward, like a giant game of tug or, or a game of fetch or breakfast. Okay? So compensation. Just think about us and how we work. And if somebody, if somebody says, hey, get me a Coke, and you come back and they give you 50 bucks, and the next time they go, hey, you're going to run over there as fast as you can, thinking, hey, I'll, you know, I'll go tie your shoes for 35 bucks or whatever. Right? You get my point. So consistency, clarity compensation the three c's of dog training something to consider every time we're training at home whether we're just horsing around with tricks with our pets or we're uh, getting prepared for the regionals whatever it might be that you're doing always keep these things in mind especially when you have an issue if something comes up that you know is, the dog throws you a curveball think about it is there something inconsistent is there something unclear right? these are important things to consider all the time and dogs are kind of creatures of habit, and a lot of times, if there is, if we have a good driven dog and a nice training system, the dog will, uh, it's not that often that they throw us too many curveballs, and if they do, it's usually a, a miscommunication of the information that we are presenting to the dog, okay? So think about those things, all right? There was uh, a really funny video on Facebook that I saw today from a guy that I've known for years. Actually, I've known him, I've known him, I think we met maybe even almost 20 years ago. Uh, his name is Bob Salomini, and he's a really good French ring decoy. And uh, it was around the time that I was as well, and a uh, dog trainer and stuff. And he had a funny video of uh, him showing a Malama biting on a suit, showing uh, the training of a, a, an out taught with positive reinforcement. So he, you know, you'll have to look up the video. I think it was on Facebook. Bob Salomini is the guy's name, dog trainer out of, I think he's out of Arizona right now. Super funny guy. Super, super funny guy. And in the video, the dog is not, he's trying to get the dog to out, and he's not trying, but he's telling, giving the dog the out command, the dog's not outing at all. And he's saying, there's your positive reinforcement out, which is, you know, there is no out. And I th and it was just really funny. He did, he had a couple funny things going on in there. and Very entertaining. <coughs> Excuse me. But it did, you know, bring something to light, which, can you train your dog and out with positive reinforcement only? And the answer is a resounding yes. I've done it dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times, if not dozens and dozens more. Uh, I pretty much always exclusively teach the out with reinforcement. I don't ever have to correct. Um, at least the traditional correction where I'm like, you know, using a leash or some type of you know, physical thing, discomfort or whatever. Uh, I'm usually able to teach it without any kind of conflict at all. So uh, it's interesting. Yes, you can uh, in most cases. So sometimes if you have a super, super psycho, psycho dog, it might be a little bit trickier, but, you know, almost in, and almost at any age as well, the dog can learn with very little, if no, compulsion at all. So, but... That brings me to the root of that, which is tug. When you see a dog biting on a suit at, you know, doing protection work or something, it's really just a glorified game of tug, of, of tug of war. And um, the way, I mean, for, for me, tug of war is, is the most valuable game. And a lot of people still, I mean, it's been since I've been doing this 20 some years, a lot of people still say, don't play tug with your dogs. A lot of vets, a lot of behaviorists, stuff like that. And um, I just find that um, silly. I mean, it's just crazy. It's like, you know, all dogs have this innate um, want or desire to scrap, you know, to fight, to play fight and stuff like that. And there's no aspect in their life where they can ultimately relieve this. So if they're playing tug, they can, because this is the only thing in their life that they can bite with all their might, shake it and thrash it and really, you know, get it all out of there in terms of what's bubbling inside. They can get it all out of there and play with you an interactive game that they need you to play. This is where it all comes together here. So when I play tug which I play tug with everybody, from Buff My Poodle, all my little poodles, my little miniature poodles, 
Um, all the dogs that come here for training, I try to play tug unless it's just completely not realistic because the handler's potentially injured or something like that. Uh, but I play tug with pretty much everybody, and I never have any dominance issues. I never have any type of resource guarding issues. I never have any of this. And I let the dog win, like, all the time. Like, for a long time before I even think about trying to teach the dog to out, they're winning the tug from me. Feeling more powerful. Feeling reinforced. This is what I'm trying to achieve here. I want to create the... Of course I want my dog's behavior to be in check, and I want them to respect me and all these kinds of things. And look to me like I'm everything. But I also want them to think that when I say go after it, or when I say it's okay to go after it, go after it. Like with everything you have. You know, run through the wall if you have to get that thing. Or jump over the Whatever you gotta do. You can do it because you are super powerful. Unbelievably powerful. More powerful than me. Stronger. That's what I teach the dog to think. We play tug and they just gotta pull harder, thrash it harder, yank harder, and they'll win it from me. And the thing is, that win is the feeling that they enjoy. Not even They enjoy the tug feeling, too, of playing, uh, but they like the win. They want to win it and win it and win it. So what they do is after they win it, often they bring it back to you in order to create another game of tug so they can win again. See what I mean? So at the same time, it's so it's completely interactive. It's completely dependent on me, the handler. It's not like I give them a tug and they go lay down and they chew it. That's not the game. So when they bring it back to me, we play more tug, they win it again, they bring it back to me, they bring it to me, and guess what, I got to retrieve. Now I got to retrieve. Now I can throw the tug 50 yards. They can run and grab the tug, bring it back to me. Now I'm working my dog out in, in a very, very stimulating, valuable way for them. So, and I find that almost all dogs love to play tug. They really do, to some degree. I mean, they all play differently, and you need to know how to adapt and stuff, but big to small, you know, the only ones that can be kind of not into it is some of the really lethargic large large breeds you know like english mastiffs and stuff like that but even saint bernards they play tug with saint bernards and they love it they love it they love to chase it pick it up bring it back to play more tug so tug i think everyone should play tug now look if you have dominance issues is tug going to help you no but the reality is you're still going to have dominance issues they're still going to be there not playing tug is not going to fix your dominance issues okay and dominance usually does not come out in the form of interactive play, where dominance comes out as like, you know, resource guarding or, or you know, just overall intolerance of too much activity or space or, you know, territory, whatever it might be. Uh, but your t I don't believe that tug will enhance dominance. I believe that tug will enhance strength and power and commitment but it will not enhance dominance. If you've got dominance issues, that's the scariest of all issues, if you ask me. You know, if the dog's reactive or skittish or a fear biter or whatever, that's cool. Like, I can manage that. But if the dog is dominant with its family, very, very tricky. But again, this is not developed through tug play. It's not enhanced through tug play. In all of my experience, and of course, this is a dominance, and these types of things are scary, so I would never lie at me or give you some type of this is, this is my strong idea right now after playing tug with literally thousands of dogs. So get out there and play tug, you guys. Use it as part of your reward system. It's extremely valuable. And if your dog, if your dog does enjoy value tug, uh, does indeed value tug and enjoy it, then you can, like I said, use it as part of your reward system. Uh, and in addition to food, and you can see you can kind of use these different things. Like food is very, is great for, precision work when we're looking at luring and specific body uh, positions and things like that uh, but when we're looking at really rewarding intent and attitude you know like integrity play is often more valuable so all this does fall within the whole compensation thing but again i wanted to touch on tug because it's such a i still i, I just i still get it i still hear it a couple times a week well the vet said don't play tug you know, like, does he fetch a ball? Do Because the thing is, if we have a way of uh, exercising our dogs that's valuable, that that can help us dramatically in life. If, say, it's raining outside and you can't go for a walk, or you just don't have time to go for an hour walk. And a walk, while very natural to a dog, because go, especially at dawn and dusk, it's very natural to a dog, um, it's, it's extremely time-consuming for very little 
physical results. You know, like if somebody's dog is overweight, I try to walk them. I try to walk on them, doesn't do anything. It's all diet, right? So I would rather, but I think sprinting and running is much better exercise. And I can do this with tug. Play tug, you know, it's like hitting a heavy bag for a dog, I think. Like if any of us have ever done a boxing class, I did a little of that for a minute uh, until I got hit in the face and then that was all over. But I did enjoy hitting the pads when no one was hitting me back. And 30 seconds, we would do like 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. And after four rounds of that, you're toast. So it's kind of a similar thing when a dog is playing tug, their whole body is engaged. There's, you know, a lot of power. It's almost isometric in a way. And, uh, and then, of course, sprinting to go get the tug, or if you're going to hold it up and reward them that way, and they're going to jump up and, you know, grab the tug in midair. There's all kinds of fun things that you can do with it. You can hide the tug, you know, so that the dog has to sniff. And, you know, doing that for seven minutes is super hard work. So they find the tug, they bring it back to you, and then you reward that good search with more tug play. It's kind of endless. It's a huge thing. And the fact that people... M- at least 50% of the time are still saying, don't do it. And I had a really great conversation with Michael Ellis, the one and only monster dog trainer, monster teacher, uh, just an incredible guy. And he was telling me, and you know, we went to record the whole thing and we had a bad connection and it's just there were too many cuts to use it. So we're going to talk again and, and kind of pick up where we left off and hopefully get that out to you guys in one of our next shows. Well, in the next couple shows. Anyway, uh, he was telling me that there's a new movement of pet dog trainers that are trying to literally, like, suppress every aspect of the dog's life, life without having to uh, correct or something like that. So just suppressing their environment, never playing tug, never letting them get in uh, stimulating states, stimulating experiences, just kind of like living in a padded room with no stimulus whatsoever. And it's just so wrong for me on so many levels. Um, you know, I mean, granted, I do things that are weird to people. I don't pet my dog. I really don't pet him too much. I certainly don't talk to him. And when I tell people, you know, I wouldn't pet him so much, they say, well, why do I have a dog? I'm like, why do you have a dog? If that's the only reason you have a dog is to pet the dog, well, then maybe you shouldn't have a dog. Maybe you should have something else that's that really doesn't require anything else other than petting. So, uh, but your dogs do require a lot. You know, they require a lot from us, and we have to provide them with that in order to maintain peace and harmony. So, if I can have a seven or eight minute game of tug, uh, that can really exercise the dog's mind and body to the point of where I can relax for the next couple hours. Okay, you come home from work, it's raining, you don't, can't take a walk, you know, whatever, you go in the basement, play some tug, or maybe you can go in the backyard or whatever, garage, have a good game of tug, incorporate some obedience in there, you know, your heel, sit, whatever, do this, okay, free, play tug, you know. And when I interact with my dogs when I'm training, my personal, like my personal dog, I only have one right now, um, it's, if you broke down our time between our training, if we're training for 20 minutes, it's going to be at least uh, 10 minutes, if not more, maybe even like 11 or 12, 10 of those 20 minutes are going to be playing. We're going to actually be playing engaged in play, where the other 10 minutes we're actually going to be engaged in behavior execution, Okay. So really something to think about, you guys. Uh, Play tug as much as you can. Do it. Just do it. Be a rebel. Go against what the vets are telling you. Uh, Seriously. um, Yeah. Play tug. Pay big. Pay often. Be completely clear with everything you're saying, all the information you're giving your dog, and be completely consistent with every aspect of your training life. And you will find that what used to, at least for me, what used to take me let's say three months to get from A to J, now takes me three weeks. I can do a lot more in a much shorter amount of time. This is, has been a, a, a blessing and a gift. And I always want to, because it's a blessing and a gift, I don't ever want to lose it. So be aware of those three things, okay? Uh, cool movie to watch, you guys, this week. Turner and Hooch from 1989. I watched it recently. Such a good movie with some really great dog training. There's four dog de Bordeaux, uh, which is a French Mastiff that's similar to like a Bull Mastiff. <clears throat> There's four of them in this movie. The main one is Beasley. It's a dog named Beasley. And these dogs were trained by the same guy, Clint Rowe, uh, who trained Jed, the dog from the movie Natty Gan that I was talking about in a previous podcast. Um, 
And again, it's like getting the dog to do some really amazing things. Not a dog that's designed for training, for sure, right? It's a dog to Bordeaux. It's not a Border Collie, right? It's not a Poodle. It's not a Shepherd. It's a Mastiffy type dog. And they get the dog to do some really impressive things, I think. And again, back then in 89, there wasn't a whole, as much uh, careful editing as there, as there is now. So the dog is doing a lot of these things, and it's very, very cool. Um, so that's the movie to check out, Turner and Hooch, you guys. If you haven't seen it, see it. If you've seen it, watch it again, If you're, especially if you're into training. And always try and like envision where the dog trainer is in the shot and like where's he standing and what signals is he giving the dog. How is the dog interpreting this stuff and what is the dog actually doing? Is he actually growling or is he, did they put peanut butter in his lip? You know what I mean? All these types of things are real fun to try and figure out. So, yeah, a couple of other exciting things. Uh, Alex will be back here this week, uh, keeping up with the podcast. We're going to start our own podcast website, um, which will allow you easier access to finding and streaming and all that kind of stuff. I don't know too much about it. The web guys handle on that, but um, that's pretty exciting. And then, uh, again, Michael Ellis is going to be on the show here very soon. Just an absolutely catastrophic day for me on Friday when I realized that the audio was cutting in and out. And, it didn't work because we had such an incredible, he's such a sweet guy. We had an incredible interview. He's super sweet, super nice, super thoughtful. Like just the kind of guy you want, you know, interacting with your dog. You know, I don't trust too many people with my dog, and this is the kind of guy I'd, I, you know, you just know everything he does is kind and fair. So, and he's full of insight and curiosities. He's always, try, he's a very curious person, and he's always, trying to uh he's just he's so cool it's, it's it was a really great interview and i i hope we get to do it again real soon and i can get it out to you guys without any type of technical glitches also we're going to have francis metcalf he's agreed to be on the show uh, soon here hopefully and he's another great trainer from california oakland i believe and he's he has canine circus school now so he's doing a lot of circus stuff but he's also done ring and bite work and Mondial ring and um, titled some goofy dogs, uh, some off breeds that aren't uh, normally suitable for the sports. And he's worked with other kinds of animals and he gets his dogs to do just the wackiest things. So I'm really interested to hear about his training methods and stuff. And he's, and he's overall a real cool guy. So that's what we got coming up. So there's lots as, as well as lots of other things to talk about I'm just trying to keep it all within a short show and you know there's tons of things i want to get to but anyway you guys i hope you enjoyed this thank you for watching or listening however whatever means you are uh utilizing love utilizing the word utilize anyway thank you very much you can like subscribe all that kind of stuff and all the necessary places and uh and keep your eyes off for what we got, eyes and ears off for what we got going on. Okay, thank you. Again, this is brought to you by Red Star Kennel. That's R-E-D-S-T-A-R-Kennel.com. Red-Star-Kennel.com. Okay, you guys can find us online. Uh, we do, you know, all the training here. We do board and train. We do lessons. We do seminars. We do Skype lessons. If you guys are not from around here, you can find uh, all that stuff on our website. Okay, www.red-star-kennel.com. Thanks again for watching, you guys, listening. Take care and have safe training. Mm -hmm.